Do you, by any chance, have a fear of flying? I, I have. It's weird. Okay. Um, when I was writing this book, I obviously got very sensitised to all these issues, and I started to sort of think about them a lot. And I, um, I realised that I always think I'm going to die. <laughs> <laughs> but I, it's not a fear of flying. It's kind of like I just, I just, it, I just, I'm convinced that I will be the exception. I don't know why that is. Anyway, I started talking about this to people, and I thought, you know, I, I always have this feeling like, even though I know all the facts and I'm involved with all the people who design these things, I've seen the tests and I've seen the data, I still feel like that. And they say, oh, yeah, we feel like that too. Yeah, 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 we feel like that. In fact, every time I sit down, I look around me and I see who's got fast shoes on. And, I, and it, it's amazing the number of people who, I think it must be a psychological thing, who kind of map their exit. Um, so, yeah, I don't... I am, yeah. I'm not afraid of flying, but I, I sort of feel like this kind of reflection on death always comes over me, even if it's a short, hot flight. I have to say, as a retired chemistry teacher, I thoroughly enjoyed this. This is just throwing the clock back. It's brilliant. Now, my question is, uh, you mentioned about the, um, the slaughter, the mass slaughter of sperm whales uh, to keep people illuminated in the evenings. Um, are there any uh, stats... Uh, that um, tell us about the recovery of whales after Thomas Edison discovered the light bulb? Um, well, yeah, I don't know about Edison, because actually what happens is kerosene saves the whales partly because of the Civil War of America, American Civil War, and what happens is that so, a lot of the boats get grounded by that, and so the whaling ships get, get grounded at, at uh, harbour, and that allows the early people who are trying to sell this much more, it's more expensive than whale oil, kerosene, it allows them a few years to get the industry off the ground. And once they're off the ground and they start rank, cranking it up, they, by the time the Civil War is over, they're dominant. So it's, it's kerosene that saves the whale rather than Edison, who then comes later. And of course, in between that is gaslighting as well. So there's, there's a few other things that happen between, between this and, and, and the sort of turn of century and Edison. Great talk, thanks. Um, what's the, I don't know if you've seen it, it's YouTube, of course. There's this sort of cornflowery liquid thing that people could, can stir and pick up and stuff, yeah. and then next minute they hit it with a hammer and it breaks the hammer. What, what, what's going on there? What, it, what is it? It's, it's a type of liquid that's called a non-Newtonian liquid, and that means that... So with water, if you, if you put more pressure on it, it, it flows faster, and that's, that's a Newtonian liquid. Sorry? Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh dear. It's a liquid problem. Another liquid problem. Sorry. Sorry. Technical hitch. We're fine. We're fine. Okay. If you if you pour liquid, uh, wine's another Newtonian liquid. Um, um, so liquids are Newtonian often, but some are not. So basically, when you when you push them harder, you know, put a bigger force on them, instead of flowing faster, they they actually become more viscous and they sort of freeze up. And the other way around is also true. You can get some that become runnier. So when you've ever done painting and decorating, they'll say, you get the, the pot of paint and emulsion and you open it, it says store, it says stir re vigorously. And it's like a jelly when you get it. You stir it, so you put it under some stress and it becomes all runny, right? So that's non-Newtonian. You then, that allows you to put it onto the brush and onto, the, onto your wall. And then because there's no stress on it, it then becomes viscous again. So you get a thick coat. So actually, the whole emulsion thing is, is an example of that that's, that you buy. And when you, if you ever are decorating and you, you think, oh, I'm not going to buy the expensive one. <laughs> this is one of those cases where the expensive one is going to, is going to do you a lot better because they've put, spent more time on the chemistry of making that transition between uh, a viscous and a non-viscous more stable. And you will get a thicker coat and you will have to paint less. <laughs> um, but there are many other examples like... Um, uh, you know, uh, quicksand and think places, you know, which, which appear solid under certain circumstances, but then you will sink into them. And if you try and pull someone out of quicksand, it all becomes viscous and hardens up around them, and you won't be able to escape yourself from, from quicksand um, because of its non-Newtonian qualities. And and then the last example is that biros, so ink, is non-Newtonian, 
And that's why, that's how biros work. They, they flow down into the nib, and then as a result of the shear force of rolling, they become thin, <laughs> and, they, and, they, and they cover nicely. And then they, they immediately set, so they don't run. So it, it gets into lots of different parts of chemistry, non-Newtonian behavior. Let's have someone from this, this side. Uh, somebody on the end over here. Keep your hand up until the microphone comes along. Thanks. You mentioned how um, we're going to need to find alternatives to kerosene for plane fuel. Do you have any ideas about alternatives that are greener for plane fuel specifically? Yeah. So on the one hand, you could say we should keep using liquid fuels because they are so energy dense. If you try and go to a, at the moment, a lot of people are trying to go to batteries, but batteries, energy per weight, and of course you're taking off means that energy per weight is a really big deal, but it's also true of cars. So that, that ratio, how much energy you go out, but how much weight it is, is really poor for a battery, even lithium batteries that are the state of the art. A liquid, a liquid fuel, is 100 times better. So if you go away from liquids to batteries, you, 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 it's really difficult to see a way in which we're going to be able to fly to America, for instance, at the moment. There's just absolutely no question we can do it for current battery technology. So then the question was, is there a more sustainable liquid that is like kerosene but isn't contributing to global warming? Well, of course, we could use plant fuels, so so-called biodiesel or biokerosene. You can make the same things because actually that's where that oil came from, right, organisms. Um, and in fact, the economy that uses this the most is Brazil, right? Brazil doesn't use... Uh, petroleum. It uses uh, alcohol, which it makes from sugar cane, and that has that in its trucks and its cars. But it's not... Oh, so in some ways you might say, well, great, we'll just grow our fuel and then we'll be done. There's a slight caveat there, which is that it's not... It takes a long time for the carbon in the atmosphere to get back into the plants. Um, so, um, <laughs> so potentially... Uh, we're kind of, we still have to sort it. We still, we, even if we switch today, we'd still have to sort out the carbon that's in the air. And the other problem is that a huge amount of very of the crops land. To, 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 if we were trying to fuel everything from crops now, we wouldn't have any food because we wouldn't have any land to buy. So you'd have to you'd have to trade off fuel with food. I, I, am I going to grow wheat for for bread or ri rice, or am I going to grow kerosene? <laughs> And um, it's, it's, it, when you do the calculations, it seems there's not enough land to do both. So, that, so it's, it's a complicated thing, and yeah, that's why it needs some fresh thinking from people like you, I think. Okay, um, more questions. Um, so there's, there's one up here, just towards the back. Thanks. Brilliant talk. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. What's wrong with liquid soap? Right, <laughs> thank you. Now you've got him started. The hamster uh, will come up, I just I know. know. Well, I'll, 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 I know how you don't like me to say that, but basically, <laughs> I mean, first of all, when you squeeze this into your hand, oh, here it is. <laughs> I mean, am I alone in thinking that essentially that feels like a, when you pick up your friend's pet hamster and it wheezes itself? <laughs> it is, it's a little tiny little spurt of something. Like, uh. Anyway, that's number one. But it's a more fundamental dislike, which is that you do that, right? Squirt. And then, if you're good, you do this. But no, you're not good mostly because you're in a hurry or whatever. Yeah. You, go, you go under the tap at this point, squirt under the tap. And then what happens is most of that liquid soap goes straight down the non-sink. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and this is a fact. This has been studied. Like Only 10% of the active ingredients actually ends up cleaning anyone's hands because of that problem. Um, and the other thing I really find frustrating about liquid soap is that the active ingredient is this thing called sodium laureth sulfate. And you'll see this in, is, if you look on the back of your shampoos, of almost any of your liquid cleaning products, you will see this. If you look in your tooth, toothpaste, you'll see this. And this is, this is the go-to detergent for any sort of cleaning action. It's incredibly powerful. And it doesn't create a scum, for, that's one thing. So you don't get that frothy scum, even in hard water, so people like it like that. Um, it's, but the, the way of making sodium lauryl sulfate, the default way of getting it, is to get palm oil from the tropics. And palm oil, right, palm oil is, you know, this is the problem we were just talking about, which is that it's become a crop that's so valuable because of the growth of liquid soap, that, and other things, um, that it, um, 
it's, you know, it, it's displacing whole habitats. And because as we keep buying this stuff, so that, that market keeps growing and the money talks. Um, so if we, if, we, if we could row back on our consumption of these types of molecules, uh, then we would be saying a very strong message, economic message, which is that a bar of soap, what's wrong with a bar of soap? <laughs> we can make it sustainably and locally here. And I think those sort of environmental concerns are going to grow. The best, uh, there is a different product that's sort of based on the same product, and you see it in airports, amazingly, uh, which is a, a foam dispenser. And what's great about foam dispensers is that actually you only need a tiny bit of this stuff. If it dispenses a foam, you're not, it, most of it's not going down the sink, so it's a better way of, of dealing with the liquid soap. So if you want a liquid soap, go for a foam dispenser <laughs> or a bar. But don't, so, so gas or solid, but don't go, I mean, the, the foam is a gas, right? But don't go in the middle, it's not sort of, it's sort of semi. Anyway. Every time I use soap now, every time. I'm sorry. It's the hamster. Anyway. <laughs> Why are you only allowed to take 100, ah, um, yeah. 100 mils on a plane? Good question, and I forgot to address that. Thank you. So, when this whole thing came apparent and people realised that actually you could blow up a plane, in fact, someone did try and blow up a plane and it was foiled by bringing nitroglycerin on board, they started to do some experiments about how much liquid nitroglycerin you needed to blow up a plane. So imagine you took this mat on, and then you kind of exploded it. And because it's got all the oxygen in there it needs, it's going to go boom. Would it, would it take the plane down? And they worked out that 100 milliliters would cause damage, but it wouldn't blow the plane up. So they said, OK, you can't take more than 100. So that means that even if you have liquid nit uh, nitroglycerine, and, and the problem is that they, don't, they find it very difficult to distinguish between nitroglycerine and peanut butter, for instance. And you think, that's ludicrous. You can easily tell the difference. But it's not so easy. They have very similar chemical compositions. And so even if you do a chemical analysis, it's not that easy. Uh, and you have to do it fast in an airport, right? You have, to, you have to get people through. You have to get three people through at 1,000 an hour. So it's not just being able to do it in a lab and, oh, yeah, that's definitely peanut butter. No, it's like, you know, it's like can you do it once every 10 seconds? And that's what's causing trouble. But you can see the floor. I don't want to alarm people. Unnecessarily, but you can see the floor in this limit, can't you? Take ten. <laughs> and then mix them all together. Nothing's stopping you doing that, unfortunately. It's theatre. I mean, most of, most of the security is theatre, as I was alluding to. Uh, but it's still the safest form of long-distance travel. <laughs> <laughs> is there a question at the back, though, coming up next? Oh, um, yeah, it's a fascinating lecture. Thank you. Um, you touched briefly upon how alcohol wreaks havoc in the human body because of its so-called OH functional group. But um, obviously, everyone gets told that drinking alcohol is bad for us, but very few people actually heed that advice. Do you think you could elaborate on how alcohol actually wreaks havoc in our body? Please? Yeah, yeah, OK. So um, essentially, your body tries to decompose it. I mean, basically, it, inter it, inter it gets straight into your bloodstream via the carbon. So, it, so even when you're drinking the first sip, actually quite a lot of the alcohol is still already going into your bloodstream because there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, um, blood vessels very close to the surface. So it, it goes through the membranes. It's a small molecule. It goes through the membranes, goes straight. So that's, why you get, that's why you immediately feel a bit of a hit. Then it goes into your stomach, and the rest of it comes through into your stomach. You, you, you can, your body has the ability to kind of digest it and get rid of its toxicity, but it can only do so about one glass an hour. And if, uh, so the more you do that drink, the, essentially the more you've got in your blood that it's not being able to kind of decompose. Then if, if it's in your blood, it gets your brain, and there it interferes with different nerve and neurotransmitters, and you get all sorts of different effects depending on your person, your physiology, and your age. But essentially, it kind of is a depressant. So it sort of um, depresses your system. If you're nervous and you're, and you're worried, then of course it will depress those nerves and worries. So that's often why people like it. <laughs> but it also depresses your ability to do actions and to you know, uh, use your muscles, which is why you become incapacitated if you drink too much. Um, so yeah. So uh, the other thing to say about it is that you can make it yourself, obviously. Um, but if you distill your own alcohol, um, the first, a bit like with the fuel, the first fraction that comes off, so if you're making hooch or you know, homemade whiskey or vodka or any pachin or anything, 
when you're doing the distillery, the first fraction that comes off is the, is the light fraction, and that's methanol. Now, methanol is really poisonous. Like we thought, the alcohol is called ethanol, it's got two carbons, but methanol's got one carbon, and that completely will attack your optic nerves and all sorts of things. And that's where the phrase blind drunk comes from. Uh, so people who used to distill their own um, alcohol but then forget to get rid of the methanol would just go blind. Um, and people still die today making their own alcohol, but also people die by drinking... Because when you go through duty-free, a lot of the perfumes, that's all alcohol, because that's, that's the substance in which the, the fragrances are dissolved. Um, and, and, and floor cleaner is alcohol. But cheap ones don't get rid of the methanol. And people drink it because it's a cheap way of getting drunk. And then they, they die of methanol poisoning. So, so however bad ethanol is on your system, it's actually recoverable mostly. It does, it does attack your liver. But methanol is the real dangerous one. Another question. Um, I think there's one at the back up here in the middle. I'm going to... Someone can pass the microphone along, that'd be great. Just wait for it to come to you. Thanks. <coughs> <laughs> Floor is yours. <coughs> um, you know glue sticks? Yeah. Is the glue inside a glue stick a solid or a liquid? So it's a it's a plastic essentially that you heat up. You're talking about glue stick, glue gun glue sticks, right? And no, glue sticks is in the... Pritstick. Oh, Pritstick. Pritstick. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, Pritstick. Yeah, okay, so glues. So, so, yeah. So now you're into what's a liquid. And um, the definition of a liquid, you sort of think it must be obvious. There's solid liquid gas. How difficult can it be? But then there's kind of, yeah, there's sort of putties and there's pastes and, you know, there are things that, Mm. Is a putty or a paste, is that a liquid or is it a solid? It's sort of got some solid qualities and some liquid qualities. And when you sort of drill down further, you realise that this definition of solid liquid is, is really only applicable to pure elements. That actually, as soon as you get into the kind of real world of glues or, uh, you know, cements or uh, the tar on the road that we talked about before, that's a liquid. It flows. And then you go, OK, so... Is that the definition of a liquid? A liquid flows. Uh, no. But, uh, <laughs> no, but... Uh, so, and, and actually, there is really no hard and fast definition that really holds up for any of these things. So what you end up talking about is liquid properties and solid properties. So it has liquid properties if it flows. And quite a lot of things that seem like solids, like the tar on the road, so you're, the roads, they are actually... They have liquid properties because they flow, and you can see that in the summer. Um, and and, and, the, and the, basically, the, 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 the crust of the earth that we're, what we're standing on now well, you know, is flowing. It's flowing very imperceptibly to us in our, in our time frame, but it's flowing, and that's why the continents drift apart and, and are crushed together, and that's where the earthquakes come, and that's where the volcanoes come from. And so, if you want, you know, what we are living on a planet that is, has l mostly liquid-like properties over geological time frames. And so the idea that this is the third rock from the sun <clears throat> is not actually <laughs> accurate at all. Um, uh, so the liquidness of things, especially the earth crust and the pritt stick and, um, and the roads, that has this anarchic quality often that kind of gets us into trouble and, it, and has dynamicism. And whereas the solid stuff, you, know, you put it there, it stays there, and that's it. So I, I guess I'm, uh, I hope I, anyway, I hope that's kind of, a, it's, it's, it's hard to tell, basically. <laughs> Mark, one of the things that yeah. you've um, talked about uh, is about rocket fuel, yeah. and you've talked about our Earth and the structure of our Earth, and about how important liquids are to us on Earth. Now, there's a lot of talk about going out to other planets and what we might find there. And there's one particular liquid that they're really hoping they're going to find. Can you tell us a bit about why it is mm. that this liquid is so important? Yeah, so when people look for life on other planets and in other star systems, they, they're often looking for a planet that orbits a, a sun that has a particular temperature range that they think it will be in. And, and the reason for that is they, because essentially we believe that water 
is a particularly, un perhaps uniquely suited towards the spontaneous production of life. So the current theory for life on Earth is not that it sort of emerged from the rocks or it emerged in the clouds, that it emerged from probably somewhere near the hot vents at the bottom of the sea where there's a unique combination of chemistry that allows molecules to, inter to, to bounce against each other and in many different combinations. So we're talking about a lifeless planet from the, from the beginning, right? And you've got these molecules, but then to... And, and that bouncing together and meeting is, happens a lot in liquids because liquids are constantly moving around. That's what liquids do. In solids, things do move around, but they move around really slowly. And in gases, if they do bump together, right, and, and, and there's a lot of combination going on, but the energy is so high that if something magic happened and you've got a molecule that sort of does something special, it almost immediately breaks up and, and, and flies around. So liquid seems to be this spot, this, this kind of this state of matter where you can get a lot of recombination, a trying out, if you like, the universe trying out lots of combinations of molecules. And then if one of them happens to catalyze, i.e. that means it kind of makes possible another molecule that's exactly the same, you get this sort of self-catalytic thing. You can get a building of a structure, a sort of so-called self-organization, and that's what happens inside our cells, right? Our cells build proteins like that. So we are this, you know, this, we self-organize, and we believe that, well, we see this in experiments, and I say we, this is the scientific body of many, many people doing experiments, that, that you know, lots of different liquids allow this property to happen. So that's one thing that's special about water and liquids in general. So why water? Well, water is the so-called universal solvent. And that's what I was saying with the, with the alcohol question, is that water will dissolve organic molecules, so-called carbon-based molecules, if they have little, little groups like like the, the OH group, it's, that allows them to dissolve in water because they, they become charged. And, and, and water has this amazing ability to both dissolve organic molecules and things like sodium and you know, the, the, you know, other stuff, ionic stuff. And so it's this melting pot of carbon chemistry, let's say, and some, and some other stuff. And you say, well, why does that matter? Well, the funny thing is when you look at the periodic table and you go... What molecules can you build from hydrogen? <laughs> it's this many, right? And what molecules can you build from helium? Hardly any, right? And you go around, and then what molecules can you build from, from carbon? And it, it goes into the gazillion. Like, for some reason, the size of the carbon atom, and it's the fact that it's got four bonds, just has an explosion of chemistry possibilities, which is unlike any other element in the periodic table. So there's something special. So when people think, oh, well, there might be life, silicon life somewhere in the universe, they're kind of making, they're saying sil silicon has that similar ability, but it doesn't really. Carbon is this unique, it seems to be a unique atomic potential. So you add this carbon potential with this liquid state where they're banging together each other, and, and that's where we believe us, all of us, <laughs> this primeval soup arrived from. So when you look for it in other planets, of course, we're looking for liquid water because we believe that carbon molecules are pretty plentiful. Well, not plentiful in, in real terms, but they're around. And we've seen them in space. And we think that they're around. And there's amino acid type things that naturally occur. So if you find water and they're around, then maybe there's life. That's why we look there. There's <laughs> <laughs> so another question. Uh, hands up. Why can you not flush some organic chemicals such as cyclohexane down the sink? You can't flush any chemicals down this sink. It, <laughs> that's not a <laughs> sink. Reminding you. Just reminding you. <laughs> um, when you say why, and you can, obviously, but you shouldn't. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> um, um, well, I guess we're poisoning, you're poisoning the, 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 the ecosystems, aren't you? I mean, I, 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 there's a quite a few, I mean, I think we've become more aware of the fact that it used to be when I, was in the lab that you basically just, if you could dilute something enough, it was fine to go down the sink. <laughs> Seems to remember that was the general rule. <laughs> What's this? I don't know. Turn the tap on. <laughs> It'll be fine. And occasionally some sh someone would come and, sh and knock on the door and go, did anyone, s you know, there'd be this enormous slick or something. Um, <laughs> so we just become, I think the truth is that we probably never should have done it before. With most, most of the stuff we make, has an effect on the organisms of the planet. And we're upsetting some equilibrium somewhere, aren't we? And we're trading off the upsetting of a natural ecosystem equilibrium, which was around before we arrived here. And 
you know, we've upset it quite a lot anyway, just being us. And, and the economic utility, or in this case, in a lab situation, whether you're going to discover something that's important for humanity. Uh, and I suppose you're always trading off the risk, right, and the, and the benefit. And I, I suppose we've become more and more cautious about, is that really, you know, have, are we just being, you know, are we just throwing, you know, the risk is, is becoming too high, I think, for us, and that we should just be more careful. And I think... I, I think I welcome that, basically, because, I, I, you know, we, you look at the kind of... Um, if you think that water poisoning of whole populations is a thing of the past, and clearly it did used to happen a lot, you're wrong. Like, there's still today, in America, there's been a case in Detroit of lead poisoning, wholesale lead poisoning of the whole population of Detroit because of, basically, not paying attention to what, you know, what is ending up in the drinking water. And um, so... You know, I, th I think we just we need to get to a, a level of kind of consciousness about <laughs> the fact that when we put something down the sink, it's it's part of our environment. I think that's why. Okay, we've got time for another couple of questions. So there's there's one over here, just towards the back. Thanks. That's great. Uh, you were talking about um, alternative fuels for planes, and uh, I was wondering, does why doesn't hydrogen? Because people talk about hydrogen cells for cars and everything. Yeah. Shouldn't it work for planes as well because it's pretty light? Yeah, and it did used to. So the first form of commercial flight was hydrogen, zeppelins and airships. And they competed and were the dominant form of crossing the Atlantic by, 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 uh, by air um, in the early 20th century and mid almost the mid 20th century, and they got in the end out competed by the, by the internal combustion engine. But the, the thing was, and this is pertinent to the point, was that when the engine itself and the fuel system and everything around it is heavy, which it almost always is, you need to be very efficient in the way you use that fuel in order to, to be able to take off, you know, to, to, to compensate for that weight. In the case of hydrogen as a fuel rather than as a buoyancy measure, which is what the airships were using it as, you've got to have you because it's a gas. You need a lot of equipment to keep it compressed, and that's heavy. And we don't and 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 it's usually steel. And to make it safe, it's very thick. And so it seems very like it seems almost like flight is the last place in which that will that that equation of of energy density to weight will ever work. If you ask me, and I think people are starting to sort of come around to this, is that although electric cars seem to be the future, everyone's sort of agreed that lithium batteries, however limited they are, they are, they are they're 300 miles is going to be enough, mostly for people, and that's going to be fine. It's the infrastructure we need to get sorted. But for shipping, moving away from diesel for shipping, and diesel is the absolute fuel of choice for almost all the ships, and 90% of all the goods in the world is diesel ships, so it's a big sector. To move away that is probably going to be hydrogen, because you don't need to worry about the weight in the ocean. And also, for hydrogen to be safe, you need it to be an infrastructure that's very well secured. And ships always come into port. So they come into port, they pick up their hydrogen, they go back out again. So it feels like shipping moving to hydrogen is the most likely. Cars to batteries, planes. I, I can't believe it. We won't stick with liquid fuels. I can't believe it. It's just it, the energy density ratio is, but that's a guess. I think we've got time for two more. Um, so I think there's, uh, I'm just trying to make sure I've got, there's uh, someone over here just right, right in the middle. If you can pass the microphone down and then I'll come to uh, someone over there next. Um, why is nitroglycerine so reactive? Yeah. Um, so the, it's obviously a molecule that is stable because it is a molecule and you can have it and there it is. But but it has, if you rearrange the at atoms that it makes, make, make part of it, either the nitrogen, and the oxygen, the carbon, and the hydrogen, you can make nitrogen gas and carbon dioxide and water out of it. And the question is, which one is more stable? And if, it's, if they're close to being the same sort of stability, then the one state can easily go into the other state, like there's not much stopping it. And, well, then you might say, well, surely they can go back again. But that's the thing that doesn't happen, because once one of these tips over into creating CO2, it's a gas, and it fills a large volume, and it knocks the next one into tipping over, and that fills a large volume. So 
you get what's called a chain reaction. So the, the, the crucial thing is that, it's, that once it goes, the whole thing goes. And that's, what, that's the hallmark of an explosive, as opposed to a combustible material like kerosene. Hi. Uh, you just now mentioned you define liquid as something with a flowing property. So I'm just wondering, what's flowing in a liquid crystal display? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so is a, is a liquid crystal, which is the screen on lots of your phones in there, if you have them, and, and, and lots of TVs. Um, so it's, it's one of the dominant forms of, of display technology. Uh, and was the original, you know, digital watch, and still is in my case, um, <laughs> technology, um, what's liquid in there? And, yeah, so, I mean, those will flow. I mean, those, those, they are sheets of a, you know, a couple of molecules thick of, of, a, of a liquid. So, in that sense, they're probably not going to flow in your watch or in your screen. But though, if you take those in bulk, they will flow. And, and yet, in certain temperature ranges, they will organize into an organic uh, regular array, which is the crystalline quality. Um, the people who first invented liquid crystals were very uncomfortable with this word liquid crystal because it, it seems confusing um, because, uh, yeah, they're not really crystals in the same way. I mean, they, 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 have, they have order, but they're not crystals. Um, and so the liquids are, you know, changing neighbors and that sort of thing. But and that, that, that's a hallmark of liquids too, that they change neighbors quite often. But you're right, there's, it's, a, it's a gradient and, you know, that's another thing that's confusing and, and sort of, yeah. Thank you, everyone, for a fantastic evening and asking such brilliant questions. And a hand to Mark.